give them another hearty amen. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you to please pray for me this morning that the Holy Spirit will not only be present, but only God's word will be delivered here today. And I pray that God will avail himself and reveal himself to cause us to further study and to drive us to the word. Amen? So that we will know specifically what we should do and how we should do it. Let's pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, the creator of heaven and earth, the everlasting, the desire of ages, the one who set the moon and stars in place, the one who pierces the veil of darkness and sees us in our sinless state, and reveals himself to us. And yet, despite all of the deformity and broken pieces that we are, he puts us back together. He establishes his covenant relationship with us. And through love, returns us pure unto himself by us being obedient to his word. I ask you here today, dear God, First of all, please forgive me of all my sins and all of my transgressions. Help me to do your will. And at this moment, at this hour, to be your transmitter. To share with my brothers and sisters in Christ the words that you have imparted and shared upon me. I ask you, dear God, to please bring us all into your most holy place. And for this divine worship hour, allow your word to be heard, but your word to be received, to be understood, to be comprehended, and ultimately to change our lives. The songwriter wrote that heaven and earth shall pass away, but not a word of your word will ever fail or pass away. So I ask you, dear God, Jesus, to please brush away all of the distractions from our hearts and our minds and channel us into your most holy place and reveal yourself to us. For I pray in Jesus' name. Power of our sermon this morning is called Tick Tock. Tick Tock. Last week was daylight savings time, correct? Last Saturday night. And we were told to take the clock and transfer it an hour forward. Do you know where that? originally began, anyone knows where that originally began, daylight savings time? Thank you. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, almost a century ago, instituted daylight savings time. The United States was at war. The United States was in a position where we had to conserve and save energy. And they realized that we needed to conserve energy and use the God-given light, the energy of the sun, in order to establish and sustain us as a nation. Because at the beginning of the war, the United States fed and fueled all the allies from around the globe. Our munitions, our guns, our foods, our crops, our clothing, textiles, were mass produced and just was shipped from around the world. From ports in Newport Beach, Virginia, to Newport, Rhode Island, to the West Coast, Long Beach, California, were used to ship out goods and services. 
and that has stayed to sustain us. Well, we as a church are at war. We don't have guns and knives like we did back in the day. But we are under attack, whether we believe it or not. We're under attack as families. We're under attack in our marriages. We're under attack in our homes. Arch Obler, an American playwright, screenwriter, novelist, and producer. How many people have ever heard of him? Arch Obler? This is a little bit old school. If you have satellite radio or a, a fan of classic radio, Arch Obler produced a radio serial drama called Lights Out. And it began with the concept of tick tock. Tick tock. And this phrase began every show. It is later than you think. Every show. I was listening to it the other night and I was like, oh my gracious. This man, and it was a lot of, you know, tongue in cheek horror, not horror as one would say horror, but made you think. And I started listening to his ominous, quirky voice as it came across the radio. And I said to myself, it is later than we think. With economic turmoil in our financial markets, looks like a military invasion every week by some country to another. Civil war taking place in the Middle East and Assyria. No one wants to say global warming is real. But the erratic weather patterns that we've experienced, how do you say it, Connie? Winter doesn't want to let go. <laughs> I believe the groundhog did see a shadow, didn't it, Lynette? And we were forecast that we only have six weeks of winter left. There's a global redefinition of everything that we've been taught to believe. A global recalibration of the values and truths that we have hold self-evident. I am just a reflector telling you what has happened. And according to God's word, I will tell you what will happen. Can I get a witness? This list will go on and on, but it has to drive all of us to our knees and to the word. We as a church may have become nearly immune to the warnings, the bells, the whistles, and the sounding of this alarm. The sounding call has gone out to get ready, 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 because Jesus is coming very soon. We on this planet of, of earth has a reservation and rendezvous with destiny that no one is able to cancel. We're going to reach this climax either walking or being pulled to the point. We're going to be faced with perilous times and struggles. In particular, the church, the remnant church. Those who keep the commandments of God and who are called according to its testimony. We will face challenges that we never thought will happen. But yet God has promised he will navigate us through the victory. I'm going to say that again. He's promised he will navigate us through the victory. He didn't say how the victory will be accomplished. He said it will be accomplished. So when you claim victory and be prepared for victory, it's two different things. When you fight in a battle and you waiting to be victorious, it looks like defeat is imminent and at hand. Elder Humphrey, I think his first name was Hubert Humphrey, used to be the pastor of the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is one of the largest churches in North America and in Harlem. When I was a kid, used to end every sermon by saying joy comes in the morning. Weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 
He said, I can't tell you how I'm going to get there, but I will get there. It will happen. In this month's public publication called Adventist World, this sentiment, this sense of uneasiness, has been encapsulated by the president of the president, excuse me, by encapsulated by the president, Ted Wilson, of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. In an article called The Urgent Prophetic Calling, I'm going to invite you to read it. This part of my message is taken from that this week. Our scripture reading today is in the New Testament. It's Matthew chapter 24. I invite you to please go there. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read verses 7 through 9. Once you have it, please say amen. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for whose sake? For my sake. Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. While there is much to be encouraged about, we as a church are faced with some enormous challenges. In Acts chapter 20, move over a few books please, Acts chapter 20, verse 20, and 21, this is a combination of both, Paul says, I've kept back nothing that was helpful. I've kept back nothing that was helpful that can help you win. But proclaim it to you and taught to you publicly. How? From house to house. Testifying to all people, Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance towards God and faith towards who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. My love for the church and the faithfulness to his words compels me to share with you my concerns. Please note, I'm not suggesting that the spiritual challenges affect every church member, but they're warranted to be shared. It's like walking up to a house. The sign says, beware of dogs. It's like going around a curve. Slow down. Only 20 miles an hour. There's a ditch. God is warning us. These are the four things that Ted Wilson had mentioned. Number one, loss of Seventh-day Adventist identity among some of our pastors and our church members. Number two, a growing tide of worldliness in many of our churches. And number three, a danger in disunity. Number four, a spiritual complacency and apathy that leads to lack of involvement in the mission of the church. Let me tell you something, the Seventh-day Adventist church is not another denomination. I'll say it again. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not just another denomination. According to Revelation chapter 10, it was born of God out of a disappointment of 1844. Just as the New Testament church was born out of the disappointment at the cross in AD 31. If you ever met a zealot Jew who believes in the Pentecost, the first five books of the Bible, there opinion and view of who the Messiah was was totally different. It wasn't in the formation of Jesus Christ. In both circumstances, the followers of Christ misunderstood prophecy and was bitterly disappointed. But out of these great disappointments, God raised a prophetic divine movement to instrumentally impact the world. According to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says, once you find it, please say amen. 
We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. God's last day people will be characterized by keeping the commandments and having the testimony of Jesus. Let's move over to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. Once you find it, say, please say amen. amen. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou, do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. According to Revelation chapter 14, 6 through 12, God's true remnant church would proclaim the second coming of Jesus, which is the third angel's message. Amen? Amen? It's calling every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people to worship the creator by keeping his Sabbath. No other religious movement fits this pattern. No other church or denomination meets the criteria of Revelation chapter 10, 12, or chapter 14. How has this come about? How are we getting to this point? You see, this has been an insipid, slowly yet creeping assault. Silent but effective assault. Globally, many have forgotten our history. Many have failed to remember or recognize our divine prophetic calling God has given our church. There's a growing tendency to minimize, marginalize, negate our differences with other denominations. Please let me explain to you, we should get along with others. There's no doubt. Amen? We're not called to be in conflict with others. We're not called to do that. But God's word, according to his word, shall divide and reveal what the truth is. Many has come from the global wide world neutralization of the Bible. Many such thoughts, excuse me, come from the global world wide range neutralization of the Bible on media and television, on cable news, on Madison Avenue. Unfortunately, even with the, some of the, the thoughts and some of the teachings of our leaders in the White House or in Congress, religious liberty is extremely delicate. You see, it involves everyone, and I mean this clearly, and I mean this sincerely. It involves everyone having a clear, clean, unobstructed right to worship, believe and practice their belief in God without any persecution, malice, or discrimination. It is important that we base our belief on God's word. Our historical, biblical method of studying the scriptures and approaching, approaching prophetic understanding from a historic perspective, is essential. God's word, his Bible, must be foundational to our belief. It's not according to Pedro chapter 1 or Cleo verse 3. It is according to what thus saith the Lord. Ellen G. White states in her manuscripts, you can look this up, volume 1, Page 58, the whole of the gospel is embraced in the third angel's message. And in all our work, the truth is to be presented as it is in Jesus. Let nothing lessen the force. This is her word. Let nothing lessen the force of the truth for this time. For the third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Our message is life and death. And we are to present it in all its telling force. Then, only then will the Lord make it effectual. This isn't me. This is her. The seventh day Adventists were raised up like Noah. Prepared to preach to the world in his final hours. And like John the Baptist, prepared to show the way of the Lord. 
we must never forget who we are and why we're here. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, at prayer meeting, a video was showed by Elder Langley. It was filmed and recorded at the Kenneth Copeland Ministry Ministers Conference earlier this year or late last year. I'm still trying to figure that out. But it was posted on the internet on February 27th. The YouTube video was recorded and posted. And I started doing some research because after that meeting, or after prayer meeting, I started doing some research on this individual. His name is Bishop Tony Palmer. I found out that he's an Episcopal Anglican ecumenical minister. His entire ministry is the re... Lord Jesus, please give me purpose. His entire ministry is to reconnect. There's a religion. I did not know this until the last two weeks. There's a religion called to reconnect every aspect of the body of Christ. Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Gentile, everything. This man has a unique relationship with Pope Francis. How it began, I don't know. He looks to be half his senior, even less than that. But this person is very charismatic, very unique. And the words he gives and how he presented this if you don't know the word, you'll be like, hey, that doesn't sound bad. I think that's good. And you know what it forced me to do? To get in the word. Amen. It forced me to get in the word. Because I said to myself, you know what? If this on the surface can mellow over you and just wash over you like a wave, anything will if you don't know what the truth is. According to Bishop Tony Palmer, the word Catholic, and I looked this up, which I did not know, and this is not banishing or bashing any religion, please. This is not doing that. He said the word Catholic means universal. So I started looking this up and understanding this, and I said to myself, this, is, this was put in place a long time ago. Okay? A long time ago. Fifteen years ago in 1999, the Worldwide Lutheran Church signed an agreement with the Roman Catholic Church at the Vatican that the Lutheran Church both believe now and the Catholic Church that we are saved by grace through faith unto good works. Five years ago, the Methodist Church signed a very similar agreement. But Bishop Tony Palmer said something in his video, because I, I watched that one and I watched the larger one. We heard me, we've been here to 10 o'clock, but we didn't watch the other one. But there's a larger one that Kenneth Copeland had posted that really availed a whole bunch of other information. And this larger one got into something called the Elijah message. And this gentleman presented himself as Elijah not in form, but by word. And when you read and listened to what he said, it was very slippery. Very slippery. He melded it in, and this is where he went. He said, it is important that we return the hearts of the children to the Father. And he kept saying that. Now, let me tell you what this is. I'm not sure if anyone here knows who Kenneth Copeland is. Kenneth Copeland came from the legacy and the foundational teachings of Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts, if you live or go south of the Mason-Dixon and west of the Mississippi and to the Rocky Mountains, he is influential in a lot of the Protestant, charismatic, Sunday-keeping churches that are not Roman Catholic and that are not Lutheran. Very important instrumental. 
This man established another person by, you may have heard, Creflo Dollar, who has one of the largest ministries on the East Coast. Very influential in verse named um, Bishop Hagen, Joyce Meyer, who you may have heard about, okay? They're calling for unification. <laughs> Just come together. The bishop summed up the entire protest of the meritus of Luther into one tenet. Salvation of grace unto good works. And he said, and I quote, the protest is over. We might as well be one. <laughs> We're all Catholics now. That's what, that's what he said. I couldn't bring myself to say that. <laughs> but when you read it and I listened to it, he said this was the tenet of Martin Luther. This was the tenet of Luther's protest. The protest is over. Come back to the Father. Come back to the Father. And I started doing some research. I said, my gracious, is that what it all was? Say it again, Martha. No. For those of you who don't know, there were 99 tenets. Can I get a witness? that was nailed to the church of the Wittenberg walls. There were 99. There wasn't just one. Am I right, Sister Martha? Right. There were 99. And these tenets gave impetus, gave strength, gave muscle and sinew to John Huss, to Martin Luther, to Jerome and Wycliffe. These drove these martyrs to give up their lives for the truth. But there's a movement underway. There's a wave moving. And guess what? You can't avoid it. You can't avoid it. The church can't avoid it. Let me just tell you, at the end of time, there's only going to be two camps. You know what they are, right? Those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. That's it. Those who have the seal of God will believe everything the word says. Not this piece and that piece and here a little and there a little, but everything. Because what's happening here? What's taking place? It's a slow erosion. You keep chipping. You keep knocking off a piece. You keep chipping. You keep knocking off a piece. You keep chipping. You keep knocking off a piece. You keep chipping. You keep knocking off a piece. And your principles become based upon what you feel. Your principles become based upon, but this is my friend. Your principles become based upon what my grandmother did. Your principles become based upon, well, you know, my father raised me this way. Your principles become based upon, I don't want to create a ripple or a wave. Jesus called us to be a peculiar people, didn't he not? Let me ask you a question. What unifies us as a church? This is serious. What unifies us as a church? Anybody? Martha, remind me of my mother. Say it again, Martha. That's it. 
I want you to understand this. The walls don't unify us. That sign on the corner doesn't unify us. It's the word that unifies us. Amen, walls. It's the word that unifies us. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's word will never fail. It's the word that unifies us. You may not believe it. You may not practice it. But God will uphold it when he comes again. It's the word that will unify us. I don't want to be lost over the word. I'm not preaching anything or saying anything but the word. Let's look this up. New Testament. Matthew, excuse me, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. It's the word. John chapter 17. Verse 17. I'm, this is the King James Version. The original, not the new King James. It says, sanctify them through thy what? Word. Thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. truth. Let's go back one chapter. John chapter 16, verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into what? All truth. For he shall not speak of who? Himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. I'm just a weatherman. I'm just showing you things to come. Unity is the strength of the church, and Satan knows this. And he employs his whole forces to bring in dissension. It's not by chance that you have conflict in your family. Trust me. He wants to bring dissension. It's not by chance you have strife on your job. He wants to bring dissension. It's not by chance at times we have disagreements in our church. His goal is to bring dissension. It is God's purpose for us to be united in the word. That's one thing we don't have to argue about. That's one thing we're not to have a difference about. But the devil knows this. He desires to see a lack of harmony among the members of the church of God. Then greater attention be given to the problem rather than to our mission. It is important for us to unite under the banner of the truth. To preach his message to the world that has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church a divinely inspired church organization. But guess what? We are gripped by the same thing that has gripped Christendom around the world. It is spiritual paralysis. It's not that we don't know what the truth is. We're hard pressed to find the time to do it the way we think it should be done. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? I want you to think about this for yourself. When you get up in the morning, you click that, click that alarm off. What is your ultimate objective? What is your ultimate thoughts in your mind? Let me tell you in my household. Got to get up. Get breakfast going. Got to wake up my little guy to get him washed up. Got to get ready to go to school. Got to be prepared for work. You go to work. You work your hours, eight hours at work. You come home. Got to be ready to get, meet them, get them off the school bus. Got to do homework. We preoccupy with the things of life. Your schedule may be different than mine. That's okay. At times, I feel like I'm fighting to carve out a place for God. I'm fighting to carve out a moment where God can come in to me to reveal his truth to me. And the only way it can be revealed is that if I read the word. 
I study the word. Recently, I've been getting up early just to steal away. Just to steal away. It's not as much as I want to at times, but that half an hour, I slip into my office sometimes, for half an hour, I just sit in the chair, I open up and start reading. Now, what concerns me a lot about this, and I'd be first to tell you, I'm about to say 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, but a generation ago, we did a lot more reading in this country than we do today. We did a lot more reading. We would pick up a book and research it out to its nth degree. According to my older brother, we live in the Pop-Tart generation. That's what we called it. Everything got to be instant. Pop. We want instant message. We have instant delivery. If you can't sum it up in 30 seconds, our attention span is gone. These kids on these video games, they play, focus, channel their thoughts on some linear program venue for a single task. Where 20 or 30 years ago, our perspective was broader. We took the global long view. Where are you? Where am I? You know, I'm glad Joanna got away with the speeding ticket. I'm so glad. I think a couple weeks ago, my brother Archie, right? You got caught, Archie? He let you go too, right? Archie looking at me. This is my point. Because Joanna did not know that she was in a 30 miles an hour zone, did not absolve herself of what the law was. Am I right or wrong? The police officer had an obligation to enforce what it was, whether you knew it or not. And guess what? Jesus Christ and God will do the same with us. We can say, well, Lord, I didn't know it that way. I didn't interpret it that way. I didn't stand it that way. It won't matter. Understand me? It won't matter. Because the truth is the truth. No matter if I say it's the truth, if you say it's the truth, or Cleveland, it doesn't matter. Matter of fact, you might as well take me out. The Bible says it's the truth. Two years ago. Yes, two years ago. In the height of the presidential election. It's about this time, as I recall. Pastor Crespo was here two years ago, was he? We got a phone call downstairs on the phone. Brother Bill answered that phone call, I believe. It was a news reporter. Two years ago, the first Friday night, I, I never forget, it took place on the Sabbath. The New York State Congressional Delegation passed the provision for gay marriage. In less than 24 hours, our phone rang in the pastor's cell. The phone call came and said, what's your position? They wanted to know, what do you believe? What is your truth? They didn't want to know what the Bible said. What is your truth? How do you practice? How do you interpret? During the presidential campaign, the very popular, maybe one of the largest leading personalities in television today, interviewed seven evangelical ministers and preachers. Just about all of them wanted to deny or just back away from the whole topic. I'm going to tell you who it is. It's Miss Oprah Winfrey. She interviewed several evangelical preachers and ministers. I'm going to tell you about two of them. The six ministers she interviewed, I saw it on the Today Show, was Joel Osteen has a big congregation. I'm a big basketball fan, if you don't know. He took over 
I'm not sure if you know if you what I'm about to say, if you understand the dynamics of this. NBA arenas in the United States typically hold about 17 to 20,000 people, typically. Okay? He bought the old Houston Rockets arena cash. I want you to understand this. These places of sports are almost like sovereign states. <laughs> okay? This contract has to be broken and get into. He bought it cash. Oprah interviewed this man and asked him point blank, what is your position? And Mr. Osteen danced around the subject like a cat on a hot tin roof. He didn't want to touch it. He said, you know, my goal is to unify. I don't want to talk about anything that's going to disunify us. My goal is to bring us together. I don't want to disconnect or disenfranchise anyone. In the end, he sheepishly said, yes, it's wrong. And it's like he knew television because Mr. Osteen, if you ever watch his program, is very much well produced. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It's very packaged well on television. And the interview time was over. She said, she whispered, she said, why couldn't you say that earlier? He ended it with it because he didn't want to follow up. What does this mean? He didn't want to deal with it controversial. Well, if anybody here is from Texas, where are you from, Jaron? Jaron? Are you from Texas? No, no, no. Where? Born there. Here we go. From Houston to Dallas, how far is that? Four hours. That's just about right. Oprah Winfrey says she hopped in the car. Her and her girlfriend, Gail, they drove to the Potter's house. If anybody knows who I'm talking about, it's T.D. Jakes. Jakes gave her an interview in the sanctuary. Now, she beat it around the bush to get to Joel Osteen. She didn't do that with T.D. Jakes. She came straight out. First question, what's your stance on gay marriage? New York has passed it. California has, has passed it. What's your stance? And I kid you not, if you want to Google it, you got to Google this. My man leaned back in the chair. Now, this man, he's not Seventh-day Adventist. I'm not sure if he believes in the Sabbath. But I'm going to tell you something that happened during this time paper period that went on, and I learned this from 3 ADN today that went on during this time period. He leaned back in his chair and he looked at Oprah, and he said to her, he said, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I'm thinking. He said, I am convicted and constrained by what God says in the Bible. This woman turned her chairs 20 way, 20, she, was, she, didn't, she didn't expect that answer. She's turning in her chair. She said, but, she said, it does not matter, Oprah, what I think. I am constricted, convicted by what God says in the Bible. So my answer is no. And this is the reason why, and guess what, church? on every issue that confronts us, it can't be how we feel. It's going to be what God says. I go back to this. I go back to this. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is the truth. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. I love Helen. She tells me sometimes, I'm, I'm old school. She said, Pedro, I love you, but you old school. You young, you look young, but she said, you talk old school sometimes. That's all right. There was an old man. Old, little short man. He's passed away now. I never had a chance to meet him. 
old little short preaching man who set up a tent on the same strip of road, same block as one would say, that the Potter House was established. This old little man, <laughs> his name was E.E. E. Cleveland. I'm not sure if you know who he is. E.E. E. Cleveland set up a little tent. And he says, I'm going to tell you nothing what I say. I'm going to tell you what the word says. And this little man start preaching. And this little man start giving the word and the word came out, and it came out like a two-edged sword, not to offend, but to unite. His goal was to unite all those who believe in God under the banner of the truth. He said, this is not what I'm saying, it's what God says. It's not what I believe who is God profess. I am just an ambassador, a witness for him. This little man preached and preached. And you know what? It agitated Brother Jake's. And before this interview came out, E.E. E. Cleveland said, it's wrong. He came out before, he said, it's, he told everybody, it's going to pass. But I'm telling you right now, it's wrong. Church, you and I may not agree of how we're going to get things done, but we can't disagree with the truth. We can't disagree with the truth. I'm asking you, and I will tell you this right now. I'm beginning this process myself. Since this video has been put up, and you can look him, his name up, Bishop Tony Palmer. Amazing Facts and Doug Batchelor has posted a 45-minute response according to the word. He took everything this man said and everything Pope Francis said word for word. And I like the way Doug Batchelor put it. He said, I'm not going to preach in this video. I saw it this morning before I came here today. He said, I'm not going to preach. He said, I'm just going to tell you what the word says. And I love it. He said, you know what? Over 2,000 years ago, and I'm closing right now, over 2,000 years ago, there was a young man about 30 years old who was baptized by his cousin. His cousin says, I am not worthy even to touch the sandals on your shoes, your feet. He said, I'm not worthy. The Holy Spirit descended upon his head like a dove, and when he came up, he went into the wilderness. And when he went into the wilderness, he was tempted and tried beyond all measure. And how did he win? He said three words. It is written. He didn't say anything of himself. He said it is written. And if you think about all of those temptations, you can rationalize eyes. You know what? I was just hungry <laughs> and I needed something to eat. My stomach was hurting. It's been 40 days, you know. I've been up here for a while. But he didn't do that. And guess what? If you and I are going to win, if you and I are going to see it to the end, if you and I are going to be a part of that first collection, that first trump, we must say the same. It is written. Let's pray for each other. Let's be unified in the word and with God. You run with God, God shall run with you. Amen. Shall we stand?
pray that our anchor will hold. I pray that our anchor holds fast to your word, which is the truth, the truth that shall bind us and the truth that shall set us free. I pray that you will bring us and maintain us and sustain us in your most holy place, not just today, but when we begin our week tomorrow, on Monday, when we're at work and when we're at school. Help us to face our challenges and temptations by the faith of your word and by the faithfulness of your promises to see us through to the bitter end. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dismiss us, Lord.